Welcome to The Craft. I'm your host, Mae Globus. This podcast is a collection of intimate conversations on artistry, mastery, and life with talented, passionately curious creatives and entrepreneurs. Most are dear friends, some are those I've admired from afar. I hope you enjoy these conversations, this exploration of the humanity that connects all of us as much as I do having them. Thank you for being here and for listening. This episode is sponsored by Happy Fox Health, a natural supplement brand focused on sea moss, a marine algae that has 92 out of 102 essential nutrients that your body needs to thrive and regenerate. I've used a number of their products and found it's really given me clarity of mind. Visit happyfoxhealth.com and use promo code THECRAFT for an exclusive 15 to 20% discount off your first product purchase. Raymond Schulman is a gentle and wise elder statesman of fashion and retail. A longtime executive and consultant, he helped grow Boys Co. to great success alongside the Goldman family for over a decade, before becoming a VP at Hugo Boss's Canadian division for 14 years. He was born and raised in South Africa to hardworking parents. His father was an immigrant from Belgium who found a career in sales, and his mother worked retail in a department store. It was a tenuous time during the apartheid movement of the 1950s, but Raymond and his family still managed to live a loving, peaceful life. In the late 1970s, he was offered a job with Seeley and relocated his family to Canada, living in Edmonton for two years before settling in Vancouver. After his chapter with Hugo Boss in Toronto came to a close, he returned to the West Coast. In this conversation, we explore the values he learned from his parents that are still very much with him today. What it was like working for a family business versus a major global brand, his people first approach as a business leader and people manager, if entrepreneurs are born or made, the things he's witnessing in the fashion and retail landscapes, the importance of truth when mentoring and consulting, his advice to entrepreneurs on their journey, what he's most proud of in his life, and much more. Please enjoy this conversation with the perceptive, intelligent, generous, and ever-caring Raymond Schulman. Raymond Schulman, welcome to The Craft. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm so glad that you said yes to this. We met through a mutual friend and a mentee of yours, Randa Saloom, who has been on this podcast. And she said nothing but good things about you. And I'm so glad that we met. We've had a handful of really good conversations so far. And I can't wait to dig more into all kinds of topics with you. Yes, it was wonderful to meet you. We had a great chat last week. And I drove you here in the rain and almost (laughs) ran somebody over. But other than that, yeah. I was a great navigator pilot. You were. (laughs) Oh, watch out for that guy. Uh, Well, I always like to take it back to people's backgrounds, and you were born and raised in South Africa. Correct. Yes. Tell me about growing up there. Um, um, Growing up there was, obviously, it was a very interesting time in in the world, in South Africa. Um, When I grew up in, uh, particularly in the 60s, in my teen years, um, with... uh, the political situation and um, so <clears throat> um, I lived in a little town on the Cape Peninsula called Musenberg where I was li- brought up and um, it was a wonderful life um, we uh, were in a beautiful place we swam had great summers we had, had great friends and a great community um, so my youth, my, my youth in South Africa was a, a, a good time that I remember, uh, you know, with, with, uh, with only good things. So, but there was definitely a background of, um, of apartheid involved. And uh, it was always there and we, we had to live with that. Mm. Or we didn't live with that. Ah, uh, mm-hmm. But growing up certainly was an interesting time. It was a great time, as, as I, you know, before I became aware. Um, great friends uh, and a, a great youth. What were your parents like? 
My parents uh, were wonderful people. My father was, um, he was an immigrant to South Africa who came over, for, he was born in Belgium. And he came over to South Africa when he was 12 years old and uh, by himself on a boat from Europe, which at that time I think took probably eight, 10 weeks or whatever it was. And he came over to live with uh, cousins of uh, his parents who sent him over because he was the oldest of six kids and um, uh, Europe was not a, a friendly place at the time and they wanted him to be safe and they sent him to South Africa and they could only afford to send one. So that was the eldest son and he went, he came over and um, um, so he, he obviously had a, a troubled life coming as a young boy to a strange place, strange people, couldn't speak the language. Uh, when I think about it, I couldn't even imagine doing that. Um, but he survived it and he was a survivor and he, 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 um, he struggled with a lot of things all his life, but he was a great father, mm. he taught me a lot. And uh, my mother was born in South Africa. Her parents were immigrants. And um, she was a lovable, hardworking woman. She was actually used to, at the time, um, mothers and women did not, it was not common for them to, to work when they were married. They were mostly stay at home. And my mother worked uh, most of my school years that I can recall, um, which was very unusual at the time, but we, we needed the money. And um, so she was hardworking, a wonderful mother. I, I had great parents that, I, that uh, were loving and warm and uh, taught me a lot, both of them did. Mm. When you think about what they taught you, what comes to mind right away? They taught me family. Is in, they taught me about family. I have a sister who still lives in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, I, I, my family was is very important to me, and I think they taught me that. When I grew up, we didn't have television in South Africa at the time, and which meant that our parents spoke to us, and we talked over dinner, and we talked afterwards, and we listened to the radio, and, and we did things together, and we had conversations, and my father would sit us down, my sister, myself, and talk to us about his youth, and he served in the Second World War, and what that all meant, and um, he taught me about politics, and he taught me about sport, and he taught me to love sport, and he, he was such an interesting man, and, um, and my mother was always there for us, even when she worked. I used to go pick up at the train station to carry her parcels every night, and um, so they, they, they taught me that family was important, and, and uh, loyalty, and learning, and... Um, and uh, making sure that family is always taken care of. Mm. What were you like as a youth and teen? Or ch maybe we'll go, what were you like as a child and then as you grew up and into your teenage years? Well, I think it was mostly a, a, a shy child. I think I, I became less so as I became a teen. I was very sports orientated at the time. I played all sports. I played rugby, I played cricket, I played tennis, I swam, and I was uh, a great fan of sports teams and uh, my friends. I had great friends growing up in school, all the way from kindergarten, many of who I'm still friendly with today, and we still in, 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 uh, communicate with each other regularly all these years, and um, we were special. Um, and I grew up under that atmosphere. I grew up in a smaller town, a smaller community where everybody knew each other. And um, uh, the, the sea, the beach, we swam and we played touch rugby on the beach and we played beach bats on the beach and it was a big surfing, a big part of my life. And, um, and we also went to school. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, and our school lives were important, and um, and our teen years were were wonderful. We had great friends, and we we partied a lot, and we did what teens do, <laughs> and we got into trouble a lot. But we always had a great group that supported each other, and as I say, still do so today. Mm. And were you always interested, even as a youth, in in business and entrepreneurial pursuits? Not really. Um, 
I always wanted to be a lawyer growing up. That's what I wanted to do. And I, I, I was always encouraged by my parents and their friends who used to come over or we'd go to their house and inevitably the converse, conversations would crop up and we would have debates and I was right in there with all the adults or my friends were messing around. I would be, I had great interest in, in world affairs and in, in uh, politics, as I say, in sports and on, on a lot of, I read a lot. I was at the library constantly. I, I used to read everything on, on American presidents and politics. And um, so I, I was always very involved in conversations and debating. And I think I was good at that. And um, everybody, all the adults used to say, oh, Raymond, he's going to be a lawyer. He's going to be a lawyer. So I always thought I was going to be a lawyer. That really appealed to me a lot. But I didn't become a lawyer. So at the time, growing up, no, my, my father was a working man. He was a sales representative. As I say, my mother used to work at a department store in, in a, a, on, on, in a, in a, in a drugstore on the beauty counters. So I never really had any experience. But I, I was interested, and I used to read a lot about business, and I would follow business. Um, Part, just as part of my general interest, mm. uh, I used to get the Financial Mail, the, I it was called the Financial Times, and I used to read it, and Time Magazine. and uh, So I was, even as a youth, I was very, very uh, interested in what goes on. And, uh, and business was one of it, but I, I, I didn't grow up wanting to be an entrepreneur. I didn't even know what that really meant. Mm. And it's so interesting because you eventually did get into sales as you yep. grew older and then also you know you're talking about how your mom works in department stores but in, and you also got involved in retail somewhat right. down the line so that's quite interesting right, right. yes I, I i did and um one of the first things i did when i finished school um a friend of a friend uh, um uh, had a, a high-end menswear store in cape town and uh, i got a job there working on Saturdays mornings. Uh, it, it, at that time, stores were open from 8 to 1 o'clock on a Saturday. And so I would go there Saturday and, and essentially put stuff away and get coffee. And But it was a great, it was a great experience, and um, I learned a lot, and I actually joined them for a longer time um, at a later stage. And um, so I, I got into retail really early, and um, didn't really like the idea of selling retail, but I was more interested in the business side of retail. Um, so it wasn't me selling to a customer that really interested me. I didn't particularly like doing that. Um, it was more of how it works. I remember pa repacking drawers of ties and having to merchandise them and the manager of the store coming up to me and saying, well, no, that's not good. Do it all over again. And I always wondered why he was doing all that, why he'd make me do it over and over and over. Because, And that made me understand that there, there, you have to, as a retailer, even at that time, you had to be really good at what you were doing. Mm. And you had to respect the consumer and have them come in and be wowed. And, and medi mediocrity wasn't good enough. So that lived with me for a long time. It mm. still does. And then in the late 70s, you ended up moving to Canada with Seeley. I did. I, 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 my ex-father-in-law owned a furniture store and, um, in Cape Town and because I got married. I had two children, two little girls, and my ex-father-in-law owned a furniture store. And through that, I was introduced to... Uh, the manager of the the, the, the the branch in Cape Town for CD Postupedic Mattresses, which was a franchise from CD in Chicago. And I, that person gave me a job as a sales rep. And um, that person's still my mentor and lives in Victoria. 
oh, no today. Way. Yes. Wow. Um, and gave me my first real job, which I thought was my first real job because it was a big organization. It was very exciting for me. And um, that person was instrumental in bringing me to Canada, also with CD Posturepedic. So, yes, I came over in, in 77 mm. with a wife and two little girls, mm -hmm. four and five years old. Mm. And how long were you there for? And what was your what was your role? My role at the time was when I arrived in, in I actually arrived in Vancouver. And uh, even though they had guaranteed me a job once I arrived in Canada, it took about a year to get here. And they never really had a job for me. They were just living up to their their their, their commitment. And it within ten days, somebody had resigned in Edmonton, which was the head office. So they said, oh, we've got this new guy here. We've got to have something to do with him. We're paying him, so we're going to send him there. So we were shipped after 10 days in Vancouver. Uh, after arriving in Canada, we, we moved to Edmonton in, in November, minus 33 degree weather, which was, needless <laughs> to say, a shock. Oh, I'm sure. And, um, and, I, and I, I, I worked as, I was, my role there at the time was a, a sales representative. Uh, for major stores and for um, northern Alberta. And then you ended up at Marquis London, right, after that. And then is I, that when that brought you back to Vancouver? Yes. So the, 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 the CEO and CFO at CD at the time had, were leaving CD and they purchased a, a company in Vancouver called Marquis of London and they asked me if I would join them as, um, as their VP of marketing and sales. It was an ongoing enterprise, um, and I jumped at the opportunity of obviously getting back to Vancouver, even though the two years I spent in Edmonton were really good years. I was a new immigrant, and uh, we learned a lot, and the people were great, but our goal was to get back to Vancouver. And um, uh, so I joined, I, I definitely said yes, and we came back to Vancouver, and I joined uh, Marquis of London in the marketing department and sales department and ran sales agents throughout North America and uh, was there for seven years. Mm. And I imagine you sound like you're such a curious person who is is just interested in the world in general. I, I imagine that you're just a, a quick study, like you learn very, very quickly um, because when I look at the trajectory of your career, you've done you've done quite a number of roles within the industry. Yes. Um, we knew nothing about leather garments. Uh, the, the owners and myself, we knew absolutely nothing. We knew our background was in bedding and finance, um, but I certainly didn't know. But we learned really quickly, and I, I adjusted very quickly, and I found that all through my career and even what I'm doing right now, I adjust to businesses all the time. And um, the, the actual product uh, is not the main factor. I learn that, can learn that quickly, but it's the fundamentals of business. So we, we, we adjusted really quickly. And yes, I, I've always had that ability to, to pivot where I needed to in terms of, of product. But I mean, I've been in apparel for certainly the majority of my working life. Mm. The ability to pivot that quickly, where, where do you think that comes from? I, I think it comes, um, you know, I think I've been very fortunate that way. I think we were all bo born with certain skills that we, we sometimes we don't even understand that we have. And um, I've just taken to product. I've taken to different situations. I've been put into different uh, uh, situations um, with huge responsibility, which didn't phase me really and I just adjusted to and just worked it hard. I worked very, very hard to learn all I could about it and and um, and was relatively successful in doing that and I think it's just instinct. Mm. And some grit I would imagine too. Yeah, I, I think it takes a lot of courage and a lot of guts and, and, and not to say no. Mm. When you're offered opportunity just to say yes and learn and get it done, learn how to do it. Mm. I'd love to know about how you, your next chapter, which was when you joined Murray Goldman, 
Yes. And this is such a fascinating chapter. So I'd love for you to tell listeners about um, this chapter in your life and how you helped build Boisco, which is a huge brand here. Was. Was. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I, Murray Goldman was a, a mainstay in menswear in Vancouver for 60 years and with Boisco even longer. Um, I joined after leaving Marquis of London um, to take over as general manager of the business. Uh, Murray Goldman, the person, was a celebrity in Vancouver at the time, doing radio ads, um, newspaper. Uh, he was a fixture in the city, and it was a great opportunity for me. He gave me an opportunity and freedom to work with him, to learn from him. And his son, David, who is a great friend of mine today and who is the person who started Boisco and created Boisco, um, I'm still very good, great friends with today. And I learned so much. He allowed me to work with him. We opened stores. We closed stores. We opened concepts. We developed them together. I learned about product from him. I learned about dealing respectfully with, 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 with people from him and just the way he conducted his business, Murray. Um, he was probably the finest man next to my father that I n I've ever known. And um, I, was very, I got very close to him. His family were a wonderful family. And I was there for 14 years. And we worked hard. We traveled together. We went to shows. We, um, we had a good relationship. Um, and I, and, and with, with, with his son, David, as well. And uh, as I say, who I, and his grandson. So I'm still very involved uh, with them as friends. And uh, I regard them as, as family, the Goldman family. But from a, a, a work point of view and a business point of view, um, I learned immeasurably uh, what what I don't think I could have got anywhere else in the same way. Mm. It was a family business, dealt with everybody in a family way, and um, that was a learning for me. Mm. And I'm curious to know what you feel. I mean, Boys Co. was around for a really, really long time. And, you know, we were had, having a chat with Juno, my photographer, and he remembers going there as well. And it was like the place to go for, for young, fashionable men. What was it that made it so successful for so long? I think what made it successful was great timing. I think David Goldman um, was an excellent buyer. He knew the customer. He brought in the right product. He worked hard to get brands that were important, and he worked hard to get them first. This was before there were people like Nordstrom's and, and a lot of other uh, retailers that we know today. The market was very different, and th there wasn't anybody doing that. There wasn't any, any menswear retailer who was doing the higher end of fashion. Um, and David brought in those kinds of collections with a lot of courage, and um, and they worked. And he developed the, the stores developed a, a, a clientele, a following, as Juno said. You know, like if you were young and you were hip and cool, and you didn't shop at Boys Girl, you were nothing. You know, uh, I remember selling literally tens of thousands of basic Boys Girl T-shirts just with Boys Girl on them, and they were in such demand. <laughs> I remember those T-shirts. Yeah, and. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we ha we had uh, people replicating them. You know, and fakes. And I mean, we were it was a brand, and he they, uh, the brand was created and was continued. And I think one of the major th issues was it didn't expand into 10, 20, 30 stores. It stayed small. It stayed tight. Uh, it was controllable. Uh, it wasn't all over the place. And it was very, very well run. Mm. And I suppose that's that's really key is not to overextend yourself when you have a business. Like you don't, you know, you were saying that it's a really tight amount of stores that you had and they didn't expand to like 100. Right. Because at that scale, there's a lot more to, to consider and overhead cost. Of course. And everybody wants to scale. You know, it's become a word. Um, everyone wants to grow big and scale and be all over the But I think the beauty of a family business very often um, is to maintain it within the family and maintain it from a control point of view. 
uh, and not overextend yourself financially um, and ensure that it's profitable. And um, it's a family business. Uh, I don't think it was ever intended to make Boyce go a, a, a national chain. It was often discussed. It was often spoken about. The, everybody wants to grow, but I think that the conservative nature, business nature, um, allowed it to maintain itself and thrive for decades mm. where we saw people come and go. Right. I'm interested to know that uh, of what your thoughts are on companies that are started by a family and it grows and then they decide to go public. I guess what for me, I'm just curious to know what are the benefits of of, of doing that business wise when you open it up to, yeah, it being a public company from going from private. I think most entrepreneurs have the the idea that they want to grow. I think if somebody starts a business of any nature, they want to they want it to grow. So I'm not against scaling. I think it was just wasn't Boy Scouts. A, you know, direction, but there are others, other family businesses that we all know who have grown into massive public companies and, and you know, I think if you're successful and you do it properly and do it well and you grow to to that point, then, then absolutely great. It's not a family business anymore, uh, but it's different, and that's fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I, I think scalability should be a direction that you want to try and you want to create. But it doesn't always work, and it doesn't work for most. So I, I think that it's, it's, it's an excellent thing to do if you can be successful at it. Mm. And so after you, and you ended up leaving um, Murray Goldman. Yes because you got a really great opportunity with Hugo Boss the Can yes. in Canada. And you were there for 14 years. I was. As a, as a VP. Yes, and I was. So that's a long time. It was. Um, I, I, Murray Goldman, uh, family business, things had changed, and my role had changed as well. And um, I've been dealing with Hugo Boss in the buying end of uh, for for a long time, for a good few years. And they'd approached me a couple of times and always said, no, I'm not moving to Toronto, and I'm absolutely happy where I, I, I was. Um, but inevitably, it came to a decision that to work with a, a global brand, after what I'd experienced of them and going there three, four times a year, um, experienced the fashion industry um, to be a part of something so special, which I believe that Hugo Boss is, was certainly my time. <clears throat> and I, I, I decided to take the risk, and I was already, I wasn't in my 20s, I was getting on, and they offered me a position as general merchandising manager to look after all product. And I took it and I went with my suitcase to Toronto. And uh, it was oh, probably the greatest opportunity in terms of my career that I ever had. Um, I was able to really thrive. It was run like a family business for Hugo Boss Canada. I think the staff, the image, um, the feeling was one of family. Even though it was a global corporation, we kind of did our own thing in Canada at the time. And the product and the brand, we traveled to Europe, we, we lived the life, we were involved, the brand was involved in everything, and we were, and all the parties, and the Toronto Fashion Festival, and all the great things, and we worked really, really hard, and I've never worked as hard in my life for 14 years. Um, I became a vice president uh, responsible for retail, for developing the retail, because when I started, there was no retail for the Hugo Boss stores. Uh, I was responsible for getting our women's wear going and all our accessory business, including shoes, going and still uh, uh, being involved with uh, 
the merchandising. So I had a lot of work. I had a lot of responsibilities. Um, but I, I, when it was offered to me, I just took the load. Mm. And um, so it was a wonderful experience. I, I can't say enough about my 14 years there. Mm. I'm curious to know what what did you learn most working with a global brand and global corporation? That's an interesting question because there, there, there's so much to it. You you get a perspective. You get a different perspective of business. Um, when you go to London and you go to the Hugo Boss office in London and you go to Frankfurt and you go to Milan and you, you, you're involved in that feeling, it's a feeling that you have that makes you just feel really, really good um, to be a part of something that in your industry is a leader and you feel proud. I felt proud to say I work for Hugo Boss. Mm. It was something that that gave me the feeling that I was part of something special. Not that I wasn't in my other parts of my career, but this was very different because it was global and I met, I would go to the collection meetings and there were hundreds of people from all over the world who were doing the same thing, had the same interests and special meetings where we would make decisions. And I felt that I was really able to contribute in a really meaningful way to this global brand and to make decisions on styles and colors and continue and discontinue. Uh, it, it gave you a feeling of, 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 of power, of, um, of interest, and of stimulation. You were just pumping all the time. And, um, and, th and that initiated the hard work mm. and that culture and that ethic that if you didn't, you wouldn't be there and I wouldn't have been there for 14 years and did what I did there. So I'm very proud of what um, I accomplished at Hugo Boss. Mm. And I imagine if you had that feeling of being proud of being part of Hugo Boss, they must have had um, a really strong set of, of values and, and purpose that they, um, that they communicated to the team to sort of carry forward. Yes, and I think it was, it was definitely uh, from the top down, as it always is, um, there was a feeling of being part of a of a very large family, and this is what we all did, and this is how we played, and this is how we worked, and what and reaped the the the, the benefits of that, and I think it was instilled into everybody to work hard. I think in terms of the values, I think in order to feel that you're part of something special is something most people do not get in their, in, in their work lives, in their career. And I think that the fact that they were able to install that into their employees globally, and I'm not saying everybody felt the same way I did, but the way people worked, I, I, I kind of felt that in some shape, way, or form that we, we all felt a little bit like that. Mm. I'm really curious to know, I, I mean, I love fashion and I have for a very long time. Did you have a favorite collection um, from a season and year? Wow. Season <laughs> and year. That's a lot of collections. Yeah. But one that stood out where you were like, oh, we nailed the design. Well, I do remember maybe not a whole season because we had very successful seasons, but I remember seeing a collection, going to a collection meetings and looking at the collection and I and I my eyes would my, my brain would just tell me, we're gonna have a huge season. This is exactly what our customers want. These are all saleable products. They've absolutely nailed it. And I would also go to some collection meetings when I'd say, oh, oh we're in trouble. <laughs> Uh, we're going to have to really work hard to, to achieve our numbers and our growth this season. So I would say, I would say yes. You, 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 and I, to ask me a specific season, I, I don't think I could do that because like four seasons a year. Mm -hmm. But I remember, the, I remember the successful ones and I remember the ones where we're not so successful. Mm. And I remember the conversations about that. And I remember the creative team 
uh, it's conversations about that. And, and that was all part and parcel of it. Fashion, you're never going to be spot on every time. And if you can create a great product that works for the consumers, then you know that you're going to have an exceptional season. And we had some and some we didn't, weren't as exceptional. Mm-hmm. Mm, it's, it's interesting to hear your, yeah, your, the inner workings of, of working at, at Hugo Boss because it's just, it's just sh- showing me that everything is, is connected, right? Like everyone needs to be, like, I mean, you were on the, on the re- retail side of things, but you needed to be part of those meetings with the creative directors in order to create a product together because it all has to work together. Well, I think that was the beauty of, of, of the brand and, and the way of doing things was that they would include um, senior people from various countries who would come together and they would literally go through all the products and the results and they'd tell you that we sold 6,000 of these and 100,000 of these. And they would go through everything, get everybody's opinion from different countries. And I think that's just the way they went about it. It was a, a long way. And there were a lot of different opinions, but I think they allowed the end user, which was before it got to the consumer, uh, because we experienced the selling of it, we experienced, they would ask us why we didn't sell this well, why we did sell it well. They wanted to know, and I think that they, the creative teams at that time um, were, really, were really interested, even though, as we all know in this business, um, uh, creative people are never wrong, <laughs> <laughs> they, and they're designers. And I think creative people take great pride in their designs. And someone like me comes along and says, "No, that's not going to work." It becomes a problem for them. And uh, so there's the human aspect of it as well, uh, that you always had to consider other people's feelings and the creative teams because we knew how hard they worked. So, but we were able to to get along, and we were able to build relationships. Uh, with creative people. So from a merchandising point of view, I knew I could go to certain people and say, hey, you know, this is not going to work in Canada for us. And if we could do this, or we could change this, or we could, it would be better. And I knew I could say that. And some you couldn't. Mm. And obviously, over this time, you were managing people and teams. I'd love to know about your leadership style. How did how did you lead teams? How did you manage people? Well, I always felt a sense of leadership from a young age. Um, I always felt that I could manage people. And when I was at Murray Goldman, he taught me that to respect everybody. So the power of a buyer over a seller is always great. And I saw the way he worked with, with, with people selling product and would come in and try to sell him shirts or whatever it was and how respectful he was even when he didn't want to buy. And he told, told me that always treat salespeople with respect, always treat people you work with respect, and always treat everybody with respect. And it's not as if I didn't know that because I think I, I got that from my parents in, in many ways. Um, I always treated with respect. I think it was just something that I didn't think about, I didn't know. But my leadership just grew from that. And I think I always was able to have people follow me, uh, respect me. I'm still right to this day. I communicate with people who reported to me 20 years ago, 30 years ago who are now doing all kinds of things. And I think that's, that's my leadership start, is being able to build relationships with staff who reported to me, deal with them in a proper way, a respectful way, uh, guiding them, teaching them, working with them. I would never go home at night at Boss if one of the salespeople was still working with a client at 12 o'clock midnight. I would wait there until they were finished and they knew that, that they wouldn't be the last one to leave the office. They would leave with me. Mm. I had somebody who I was trying to employ at one time who we brought in from Vancouver to Toronto, and I took her through our warehouse, and on the way back to the airport, 
She said, you know why I really want to join Boss? Is today I made up my mind. When we walked through the warehouse, all the warehouse staff said, hi, Raymond. And you answered them and you spoke to them all. So, you know, I, I feel that's been my strength is my ability to, to get people to work with me, treat them with respect. No matter who it is, I don't care if they're the CEO or the person who makes the coffee and cleans up at night. Um, I, I treated everybody the same, and my leadership role was to lead from example because I wouldn't allow anybody to work harder than me. Mm. I think that's such wise advice. And at the, com- at the company that I was last with, I remember the executive director giving that same advice, and he said, it doesn't matter if they're a receptionist or a sales coordinator, you treat them the same way as you would treat someone who is on the C-suite level. Right. And that stuck with me. It, it really stuck with me. And I, I, and I like to feel that I've always operated that way too, with respect to everyone. Everyone deserves space to be seen and heard. Absolutely. I think everybody's circumstances are very different in their lives and their backgrounds. And when you hire people or people come work for a company, you, you don't know a lot about them. So getting to know them being flexible, being honest. I think today it's expected more in businesses than it was during my time, uh, where there was a, 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 pow- a powerful and, and a non-powerful. Um, today, I think the employee expects a very, very different approach from management, and I think management in most cases hopefully uh, acknowledge that and know they have to treat people differently. But certainly during the 70s and 80s and 90s and 2000s, that definitely wasn't the case. And so, you know, I, I, it didn't, that didn't register with me in the same way as it does today. But I think I just did it because that's who I was. And I dealt with people on the same level as I would deal with anybody. Mm. You know, something that stuck out to me in our coffee last week when we were talking about mentorship and the businesses and the, and the business um, entrepreneurs that you were mentoring is that you always tell the truth, whether right. you feel the business is going to be successful or whether they need to fold, even if it's just for now, and do something else. You always tell the truth. Yes. I believe uh, mentorship has been, mentorship has been, I think I've mentored, all through my career in, in a management uh, role, uh, from small management roles to, to to senior management roles, I think I've always mentored people. I think it's just within me. And being a mentor for the last nine years, um, and as well as a consultant, but certainly as a mentor with new new startup businesses, early stage businesses, um, the first thing I do tell them is that if we're going to work together, I will always tell you the truth if this if this business you can make it in this business or not I'm going to give you every opportunity I'm going to work with you but I, if it reaches a point that I believe it's in your interest I'm going to tell you it's not going to work and as an entrepreneur that's a hard thing for someone to hear because no one becomes an entrepreneur or starts up a business believing that they can't be successful mm-hmm. otherwise they would just get a job uh, I think entrepreneurs, uh, I respect them. I have a great respect for all entrepreneurs that I've worked with. I think it's courageous. I think it's an incredible person who will do that. Um, I've seen many of them, and I think they just, it's, they're outstanding people. But not all of them will be successful. And my job is to tell them the truth. And if they can eventually make it and what they have to do to get there. But if it doesn't happen through a lot of different circumstances, then I will tell them that too. And I won't lie to them and tell them it's going to be successful if I don't believe it will. Mm. Do you think entrepreneurship is an, a natural ability? Like when you meet with people and you get to know them and you see their work ethic and their passion – yeah, is it something that's innate in some people, or is is entrepreneurship something that can be grown 
and learned. I believe it's. I believe it. You. I believe you're born with that gene. Um, I've seen entrepreneurs uh, with training from being a dental hygienist to being a biologist to doing starting jewelry stores and clothing uh, businesses and all kinds of businesses which had nothing to do with their upbringing or training or their parents. This is just something that built in their, their growth. And this is something they wanted to do. And there came a time in their lives where they said, I'm going to do this, even though. And most entrepreneurs who start businesses, in my experience, only know. They only know what they, they know. And that's to build a business with, the, with whatever the product is they're trying to create or sell. And the rest they learn along the way, and they don't always have the money to do that. And they struggle, and they work seven days a week, and they, it's hard, but they wouldn't want to do anything else. And most entrepreneurs that I know would not go back, and I've said to them, I say to them, you can go and join the company every two weeks, you're going to get a check. You'll make a lot of money, you'll have great time, you'll be out with your friends, your families, all kinds of things, and they don't want to do that. They want to build a business. And I, I, I don't believe it's something that you can go to school to learn. I don't think that people naturally, because it's just too hard. you got to really want, I know entrepreneurs who, who've started multiple businesses and have said to me that I, I just want to start a business. I have these great ideas, but I can't get it going. I don't know how. Where does this come from? They've got jobs right now, but they don't want to do those jobs. They want to be an entrepreneur. So I think that when I think of people like Murray Goldman, who we've spoken about, who came, came to Canada as a young boy from Poland to wash his father's sweep floors in a clothing factory, decide he wants to have his own business, I think that was he could have gone and worked for anybody. So I, I don't think it's a new phenomenon. I think that entrepreneurs are... Definitely born. Mm, interesting. And so after Hugo Boss and your your chapter there, um, there was a centralization that happened and and I think it was your feeling like it was it was close to your time um, to do something new. And you moved into consulting with Dig360. And that's what you're doing now, uh, as well as mentoring with Futurepreneur. Um, I want to know what makes a what makes a good consultant. Are there traits of a good consultant, or yeah, or can anyone who has had experience be one? Well, I think anybody could with experience could be a consultant to a certain degree. I'm not saying you can be a good consultant, but you can consult. I think it's a really hard job. I think it's a really hard position to be in. Um, most businesses do not want to pay for a consultant. Um, so it's a, it's a hard job to make a living at. Fortunately, I was in a fortunate position where I, I didn't have to do that. But to make a good consultant, I think um, my colleagues at Dig360 are really good consultants. And I think what they all do, what they do, and what I certainly do with them is we once again are honest with the potential customer and we consider not just the fact, the fact that consultants get mostly called into a business when it's in trouble. Uh, very few people hire a consultant when they're successful. They might hire a consultant to scale and, and for different purposes, but mostly you're, a, you're, you're putting out fires for people and I think it's a difficult time for them. So um, consultants have to go in there and do a really quick, sincere, honest, and very detailed have a look at that business and be able to sit down with a potential client, customer, and tell them where their business is and what they've got to do to get out of it and how you can help them. And you can't always help them, but maybe you can network and others can help them. Maybe contacts of yours could help them. You can guide them. Um, so it's not always a case that the consultant can go in there and solve all the problems, but you can definitely help them to find help. 
Um, and if you can help and the relationship connects, it's there. Um, there's got to be a trust level, a belief. They're going to pay you money. Um, so that's definitely a consideration because in many cases they don't have spare money, mm. but they're in that kind of trouble. So I think you have to be very dedicated to the customer, uh, the person who's looking for your help, and work well with them. Mm. You've seen the fashion world and, and the retail worlds. I mean, you've been in it for decades. When you look at the landscape of both right now, what do you see is dying in those industries, but what do you also see emerging? Well, the fashion industry has definitely changed and is, is in constant change, um, certainly through the last uh, pandemic years, we've seen so much uh, fallout. Um, what's difficult in, in retail today, and certainly in fashion today, is to be able to decide how to sell your product, and where you're going to sell it, and to whom, and how. And um, you never have you have issues today that was never considered in the past. So you have a whole omni universe out there. Um, small retailers have a hard time with that. Uh, small fashion retailers have a hard time with that, but there's also advantages uh, to that because I think the the smaller retailer, the smaller fashion customer, uh, today more than ever can build a clientele. And as much as in my day we used to preach salespeople to build a clientele, we didn't worry because people walked through the doors. Uh, there was traffic, there were people you could sell to, and today it's not the case. So clientele building is very, very important today and I think the fashion industry has changed so much in terms of the way in which they 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 sell their product and all the different channels and avenues that they have to sell it which has a lot of problems and you have people like Nordstrom's and Walmart um, putting hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into into new software and into technology tech you know this was never a problem the the, the worst problem Retail, fashion retailers or any retailers had was your, your, your cash register and what it could give you. But it's a different world today. It's evolving. I think the new people, you're seeing a lot of information uh, executives become CEOs. Um, we, 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 we see that a lot happening right now. So the whole information aspect of, of fashion is becoming more and more important. Um, and how to deal with that, it's, it's become difficult for designers. They have the technology, but what can sell, how how the collections have changed, the brands have changed, how the consumers change, what their needs and wants are. Um, there's a goal that less is more, people don't want a lot of product. A fast fashion uh, has become a, a dirty word in a lot of uh, uh, worlds. Uh, so it, it's evolving and changing, and the consumer's changing. The customer is certainly changing. The new generations that are coming up are changing of what they want. Hard to know because it's happening so fast. It's happening so quickly. By the time you get going with something, it's already changed. So I think it's really a, a hard industry to be in. It's always been a hard industry. But I think today, and it will evolve uh, you know, into even a more difficult industry. But I believe that people are being trained um, the new generations that are coming up will have will not know anything else. This is what they'll know, and they will just work with it. Mm. So as much as things change, probably not so much. Mm. Interesting. Mm. And for you, what's what's on the horizon? For me, I, I'm going to continue doing what I do, and that is uh, mentoring businesses, small businesses, startups. Um, it's something that is now ingrained in me. Um, I'm, it's, I get tremendous satisfaction and rewards from it. I put everything I have into these businesses. Um, sometimes I want to go in there and do it for them, and I get so frustrated, um, but I can't do that. But that's what I'm going to continue doing as long as uh, I am physically and mentally capable of, of uh, not making a fool of myself. Uh, I will continue to do that. Mm. 
You know, it's it's really interesting. I was reflecting on what you said about the values or what your parents taught you, and and one of the words that you said was was loyal, like loyalty. And if I think about, you know, your your career, you were with companies for a really long time, so you were very loyal. Yes, well, I, I believed in loyalty, and I, I I also think I was very fortunate. Is that the companies gave me reasons to remain loyal, and to be there for a long time. Um, I, I I think I, I had a career where I was fortunately lucky, and I I think about it a lot. Um, as much as I I know I did good things and I did good work and um, I think about how fortunate I was and doing what I'm doing now and having the experience that I have, I don't think many have been as fortunate as as me. So I think that's why I want to give back because sometimes you don't think you necessarily deserve to be that lucky. Mm. And, um, And luck is a you know, as a word that we throw around, but uh, sometimes it's you're fortunate enough to be at the right place at the right time, but you've also got to do the work. And if you don't do the work, then that all doesn't matter. Right. So you've got to be successful and you've got to prove that you can do what you can do and then you will be there for 14 years and long time, and seven years. And, and I think today people don't want to be at a business for 14 years anymore. I think people want change and a lot of change. I was happy. I was loyal. I was there. I wanted to help be a part of it. Family, to me, it was working with the people and the family and people came and people went. Um, But Raymond stayed. (laughs) (laughs) You sure did. (laughs) Well, just a few more questions for you. Um, The second to last question I have is to all the entrepreneurs out there who are new um, as well as established, what would you? What are two or three things that you would like to share with them that you feel that they need to know about this journey that they're on? Keep learning. Keep learning. Keep finding out how to solve problems. If you're weak at something, something doesn't interest you, then get help. Find somebody who can teach you. An entrepreneur has to be the person who cleans the floor and the CEO. You can't know everything. So get help. Find somebody who can help you. There are organizations out there, there are people out there who are willing to help you. So you're not going to know everything. Don't expect to know everything. But try and keep learning. You can't be an expert at everything. But you can definitely be an expert and what you need to be in, that's to create product, create a business that can sell, that's viable. Don't lie to yourself. Always be realistic. Have dreams. Dream high. But know that those dreams may not necessarily materialize in the same way you think. I think entrepreneurs evolve. And I've seen incredible involvement evol- of, of people from knowing nothing to knowing something and becoming confident. And so confidence is a big factor, believing in yourself. But my message to all entrepreneurs who may listen to this podcast is get help when you don't know. Don't be shy. Always ask. There are people out there who will give you answers or do their best to do so. Mm. That's great advice. And actually... I I had one last question, which I ask everyone, but I just another one popped into into my mind. Um, And it's just just you asking you as you reflect back on your life. um, Yeah. What what makes you feel really proud when it comes to your life? Oh, my 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 pride is my on my daughters. Um, No question about that. Um, I have two daughters. I have grandchildren who I'm very proud of. I'm proud of my family. I'm proud of what my daughters are, what kind of people they are. Um, I'd like to say that I I played a part in that. Um, But I'm I that that's my pride and joy. My pride and joy is not my what I've done in terms of my career and what I've achieved. Uh, I'm proud of that. But my real pride 
are watching my daughters grow to the woman they are today, to strong, confident women that they are today who are wonderful mothers, uh, whose children absolutely adore them. And um, so seeing that, and seeing the way they conduct themselves and how hard they work and how interested they are in people and and they, their families uh, makes me a very proud person. Mm. That's really beautiful. My final question that I ask everyone, with what you do, what is it that you want to leave behind in the world? I, I, I think that what I'd like to leave behind is... Um, is respect and credibility. Um, you know, I, 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 I would like to believe that people know um, who I am, um, what I am, um, and that I'm a credible, good person uh, who's done everything they can to help people along the way, um, and a great father even if I say so that myself. <laughs> Raymond, thank you so much for your time. I've enjoyed every conversation we've had so far, and I look forward to many more with you. And uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very May. much. Thank you very much for all the wisdom that you've, you've brought into my life in such a short amount of time. Well, thank you very much. It was great meeting you. We've had a few days since last week, and we've spent some time together, and I think that I uh, wish you much success, and uh, I think you little I know of you, and you're a great person, and I think you'll flourish in what you do, and um, I hope to continue knowing you and uh, stay in touch. Absolutely, 100%. Thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed that last conversation, be sure to check out more episodes with Craft on Spotify and guest photo galleries on the website at wearethecraft.com. Thanks again for listening.